We've arrived in the People's Republic of Vietnam at a time of great change. Ho Chi Minh, father of the country, is a memory. You don't want to make them too wide, Charles. <laughs> Vietnam is rejoining the world. Hanoi has sprouted hotels, mobile phones, English language newspapers, and cricket. English expats v Indian expats. Okay. I'm asked to come along, watch okay. the game, and spin the coin. Head. And it's tails. Tails. I'm tails. There we go. Okay, well, I think we'll bat. It's a chance to find out more about the policy the Vietnamese call doi moi, new thinking. But old thinking reasserts itself as our cameras are ordered to be switched off. Our stills photographer keeps going. They're not interested in cricket, they're interested in us. England not only have to cope with fierce Indian bowling, but a Vietnamese military build-up as well. The officer in charge rings his supervisor. He calls for reinforcements. International diplomacy is brought to bear. The British Embassy is informed. India House is put on red alert. The Pentagon will call us back. The Vietnamese arrive in force. We retreat. What's happened is that the only pitch where they can play in Hanoi is actually on land owned by the Vietnamese Air Force over there, and filming the cricket match was deemed to be a threat to national security. The Vietnamese do not look a warlike people, yet they fought like tigers for the last 50 years against the French, the Americans and their allies, and the Chinese. Now they can live the way they want to. Banners across the road proclaim the message of socialism, but the shop fronts proclaim the message of the market. In the Vietnam War, this prison, where captured Americans were interrogated, was known mockingly as the Hanoi Hilton. Now it's part of a property development from which a real Hanoi Hilton may one day rise. Where Americans were once tortured, they will one day come to be pampered. Despite the changes, an air of wartime austerity still hangs over Hanoi, and the railway station undoubtedly smacks of a more comradely era. Which way to the, the train for Saigon? Which, this way? Yeah. yeah. I don't, you don't want it. OK. I'm leaving on the Reunification Express, southbound for Ho Chi Minh City, which most of those who live there still know as Saigon. Its average speed for the distance is 25 miles an hour, so there's no rush. The Vietnamese coast curls gracefully along the South China Sea. The railway follows it for 1,250 miles on the long haul from Hanoi to Saigon, from where, God willing, I shall eventually strike east to the islands of the Philippines and Borneo. At mid-morning next day, various delicacies are prepared for lunch. Pork is unwrapped from banana leaves. There are prawn fritters and raw vegetables and something in a bucket. We're crossing the Ben Hai River, the border of the old demilitarized zone. We're now in what I grew up calling South Vietnam. The scars of war have been quickly covered by this fertile landscape. But the main highway is still woefully inadequate for a country that hopes one day to become a Pacific tiger. 
and this railway, the main link between north and south, is still only single track. Four hundred miles south of Hanoi, we pull into the city of Hue. Tourists are welcome in Vietnam these days, but fare dodgers are definitely not. The old imperial city lies on the Perfume River. One of the fiercest battles of the American War took place here, and the central span of this bridge was bombed into the river. Today, it's busy all day long, as is every other thoroughfare in this crowded land. If you want a bit of peace and quiet, I recommend the Forbidden Purple City, seat of the emperors. What happened to the royal family? I mean, presumably, are there any of them still alive? Uh, as I know, the last emperor, our last emperor, about that, he's still alive in France now. Oh. He's about, about 83 years old. And is there any, anyone in Vietnam want him back to rule the country? Uh, I don't think so, yeah. according to my opinion. I think uh, he's only now, in our mind, yeah. he, he's the king of the past. King of the past, yeah. yeah. This is good. Yeah, here is the bell. Made, made, of... made in, uh, in, uh, under the time of the second king, Ming Mang. My guide, Miss Hong, explains that this was the religious and cultural center of all Vietnam. But as we move from the gatehouse and through to the heart of the temple, I'm in for a shock. So now we are at the center of the Forbidden Purple City, where uh, the royal families used to live inside here. But there's nothing here at all. Well, not it's all gone. Yeah. The French started the work of destruction, and the Americans finished it off. It's as if the Forbidden Purple City had sprouted wings and flown away. The Perfume River is Hue. People drink it, wash in it, fish in it, and live on it. I've hired a sampan to take me out on it. Progress is picturesque, but pretty slow. It's not as easy as it looks, is it? That's difficult, I think. Difficult for someone to understand all the turning, yeah. You can start the engine now if you want. Okay. Start, start the engine now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. You can now start the engine. Director says, yeah, he says, start engine now. <laughs> I mean, uh, what do I have to say? Uh, so, where is the engine? It's on the yeah. Yeah. OK, can you start it now? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Good. Now. Now, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yeah. right. And in in the in the in the uh, in the the gear, the, the motor, uh, the yes. motor. Yes, I'll go here and you start it. Okay. No. I yes. Don't... Once we're underway, there are no problems. That is until we have to stop. Oh yeah. You turn the engine off. Kill engine. Stop engine now. Yes. OK? okay. No. <laughs> Good. Stop engine. Okay. Yeah, stop it now. OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't do this. Uh, will, you, will you stop engine now? Yes. Yeah, I'll move this. Oh, here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Move this. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's it. All right, can you turn it off? My destination is the Tian Mao Pagoda that has stood here for 400 years. But in the Buddhist monastery next door to it, I discover something much newer and infinitely more macabre. This is probably the most famous Austin motor car left in the world today, because it was in this car that a monk from this monastery was driven to Saigon one day in 1963, and he set a light to himself in protest against the way 
the Buddhists were treated by the Saigon government at the time. It was a, a world-famous photograph was taken um, of the monk, and in the back of the photograph, there is a picture of this very car. And it's really kind of weird to see it here, a photo that one knows so well. It's also rather strange, because my father had a car exactly like this, same colour, same make. I mean, I went to school in a car like this. Next morning, the heavens open in style. 80 days away from the Arctic Circle, we're in monsoon country. Today, we continue our journey on the next reunification express southbound out of Hue. When the French were booted out of Vietnam in 1954, they didn't leave much behind but they did leave a railway. And their word for railway station, Ga, has somehow survived. The train slows as it toils up from the narrow plain to Hai Van, the pass of the ocean clouds. The mountains come close to the sea here, and at Da Nang is the most famous of them all, Marble Mountain. Hello. It's at the foot of Marble Mountain that I meet Miss Tan. Would you like to buy something? What are they? This one, oh, they're just bits of they're yeah. marble, little marble. To... Yeah, this is marble mountain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see the mountain. Yeah, this way up. Yeah? You know yeah. how... Where, where do I go? Just keep going? Yeah, keep going and go left. Will you show me where, what yes. to do? Okay. You go up this way. Okay. I pick this up and step up. I may not buy anything, I yeah, warn no you that. Problem. I'm very, very Don't mean. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> be happy, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be happy. You go up this way and later you go down in another way. <laughs> how do you learn... Where, where do you learn your English? At school. It's very good. Mm -hmm. I don't know many Vietnamese who could say lovely jubbly. Lovely jubbly. What else can you say? Uh, you you say want to learn Vietnamese? Hmm? You want to learn speak Vietnamese? Yes. Just, I'd just like to be able to say hello. Xin chào. Hmm? Uh, hello is xin chào in Vietnamese. Xin, xin, xin chào. Xin chào. Yeah, that's right. How often do you do this? How many days a week? Six days a week. Really? Every day? All no. day? No, all day. We go to school in the morning. You go to school in the morning? Yeah, ah, of course. In the afternoon, seven. Because tell me how old you are? 16 years Six, old. 16, that's right. Yeah. And when will you uh, leave school? 22. 22? That's a long yeah. education. Um, At the same school or will you go to university? Uh, university. Where? In Da Nang City. Da Nang. Yeah. And what do you want to do? I want to be a doctor. Ah. So, you can see daylight. Looks as though we're nearing the summit. Is that right? It's yeah, not a right. big mountain, but it's where it is and what's next to it that's oh, yeah. important. Oh, that's spectacular. Spectacular. Yeah, spectacular, as we say in English mountaineering circles. Here you see five mountains. Yeah. yeah. That, that's metal. Right. Metal. Wood. Yeah. Small one. Wood, yeah. Fire, two. Yeah. Earth. And this is water. This is water. So, water. having got up here, that, have I done some good for myself? Yeah. Will the gods smile on me or? Here you sit down to be the king chair. Yeah. For that... family, very lucky and long life. A long life? Yeah. Mm. For you, old man. I could do... <laughs> I think I've had enough, don't you? Quite enough. 52 years. It's quite enough. I'll try there. Might get another 10 years out of it. Okay, you sit down to I be the king I feel like drink chair. anyway. <laughs> okay. Nice. Let's have a sit. Out. Thank you, by the way. <clears throat> King's throne, adaptable for all sizes. Ah! Oh, that's better. I feel, I feel revived already. I feel at least, you know, ten more years I could go on. Yeah. Let's make this a 25-part series. In Cinemascope, get rid of those mountains.
Anyone got a beer? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I think this country will be a great success. There's always someone around with exactly what you want. Miss Tan is very likely to be a future president. Her fluency in English makes my dumbness in Vietnamese quite shaming. And she's incredibly well informed. Marble Mountain, I'm learning, is much more than it seems. It's a holy place and a military stronghold. But Miss Tan will not let me leave until she's shown me its darkest secret. Well, I can see what you mean. I need your hand. It's absolutely pitch black and very slippery. Be careful, slippery. Here we are. Uh, I can see now. Yeah. Water. Ooh. Hey. This is for God, too good and too evil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This one good got to heaven and evil got to hell. These are the guardians that you find at the entrance to any Buddhist temple. Yeah. So this is a working temple. Do people come and worship here? Yeah, many people come to worship Friday yeah. Buddha. And that's live. the altar. Live while they live. That's extraordinary. And this Holy War American bomb. Hmm? This is the Holy War American bomb. Oh, right. Yeah, so before. The, the American bomb kept, made that hole? Yes. Before in 1938, on this Kerry War Hospital. And after American bomb down. Yeah, there was yeah. a hospital here. Joined, yes, joined before. Vietnam. After that, I need some fresh air. I take a walk on nearby China Beach once a favoured haunt of off-duty American troops. Now there's only the roar of the ocean for company. Or so I thought. American forces may have gone, but the sight of a lone Westerner without a seashell or a slice of mango is just too much for the local children to bear. I'll tell you, now I've got 5,000... 15,000, 15, there we go. 15,000. There we go. All right. There's, there's 20,000, and I have his as well. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you, kids. Bye. All right. Make sure she gives you the money. I'm on my way to Vietnam's deep south and one of the world's great rivers, the mighty Mekong. After its two and a half thousand mile journey, the Mekong forms a huge delta here. These are fortunate people. The river deposits enough mud on Vietnam to increase the size of their country by 200 feet a year. And what's more, it's high quality, well-traveled mud. So there are probably a few grains of Tibet in here because it rises in Tibet, rather large chunks of China huge bits of Laos, chunks of Cambodia, but it's now incontrovertibly, all this mud belongs to Vietnam, and it forms one of the most profitable agricultural areas in the world. So where there's, uh, where there's mud, there's brass. As they say in southern Vietnam, not in that sort of accent, but, you know, know what I mean. This being Vietnam, a little bit of water doesn't stop people buying and selling. These dugouts become shops and shopping baskets. And this being Vietnam, you can find almost anything you want. <laughs> How much are the snakes? Are they pets or are they for to eat? <laughs> Getting into difficult water here. What, hundred dollars for each? Two hundred dollars, well, I think we'll, we'll keep looking. <laughs> I don't just want to buy a snap snake, you know, without checking out. Are they poisonous? <laughs> They're not poisonous. Why would I want them? Apart from to eat. From this little delta town dominated by a Catholic church, it's a short hop to Tainin province, home of one of the world's newest religions. It's called Khao Dai, and it was invented by a civil servant in 1926. 
This splendidly designed religion is a sort of spiritual curry containing a little bit of everyone else's religion. The writer Graham Greene was so taken with it, he seriously considered becoming a convert. In the foyer of the great temple is a mural depicting three of Cao Dai's patron saints. Chinese revolutionary and statesman Sun Yat-sen, Vietnamese poet Nguyen Binh Kiem, and Victor Hugo, author of Les Miserables. Spirits play an important part in Cao Daiism, and messages have been received here from Joan of Arc, William Shakespeare, Louis Pasteur, and Lenin. Despite this all-star cast, Cao Daiism has not made much of a mark outside Vietnam. Nor, to be honest, outside Tainin province. As we draw closer to Saigon, we pass an extraordinary relic of war. And um, this area here, this underground area, so it has a hospital. What else does it have? What other uh, facilities? It's connected to the meeting room. These are the Kuchi tunnels, a 100-mile underground network built to house guerrilla armies fighting the French and the Americans. Despite being blasted with bombs and raked with defoliant, they were never destroyed in 35 years of warfare. What was this? You can see here the fighting bunker of guerrilla forces before. How many people could be hidden underneath the the earth and these tunnels at any one time? Normally about 5,000 guerrilla forces can stay inside the tunnel one time. Before I expire, can I uh, explore a little on my own? Okay. Is, that okay. is that allowed? Yes. Okay. Please. All right, I won't go far, but I'll try this one down here. Yeah. Well, this leads to another fighting bunker. Uh, come to another, yeah. another okay. not fighting bunker, another room. All right, another mm -hmm. room. All right, I'll see what that's like. Here we go. <coughs> People lived here for up to two weeks. Two minutes are enough for me. I head straight for the emergency exit. Hello, Ratty. Hello, Molly. I'm obviously not cut out to be a guerrilla fighter, otherwise I'd have closed the door behind me. I find little resentment among the Vietnamese about the war. Maybe it's because they won. But this museum of war crimes in Saigon shows they won't forget. There's one particularly gruesome exhibit, a guillotine, bequeathed by the French, last used against the Vietnamese in 1960. If I were ever to make a series of great post offices of the world, this one would have to be included. Uncle Ho beams down as I write all those postcards I've been putting off for weeks. Dear Helen, dear Rachel, dear Tom, dear Will, only nine months to go. Happy Christmas. It's time to leave Vietnam, if I can. My impression is of a small, crowded country riding a high tide of energy and confidence. A country where there's no point in shouting stop. No one will hear you. A thousand miles from the heaving crowds of mainland Asia are the heaving crowds of the Philippines whose capital, Manila, with a population of 12 million and rising, is one of the Asian Pacific megacities. This is what happens when bicycles become cars. The gridlocks of Manila are enlivened by the jeepney, that peculiarly Filipino conveyance evolved from American jeeps left here at the end of the war. They're brightly painted and often eccentrically named. Well, not always. 
Manila has just about every problem a big city can have. Too many cars, too many people, too little space, too few houses, not enough money, not enough jobs. There's no unemployment benefit, no income support to fall back on here. If things are bad, and they usually are, these people club together to pay an agency fee so that one of them can go abroad to earn money and support the family back home. I'm outside the headquarters of the Friends of Filipino Migrant Workers. So we were discussing about uh, labor export. <coughs> and uh, the export of labor uh, generates about $2.5 billion. One of this country's most profitable exports is its young women. Just imagine how big the amount goes to our country. That's why we are considered as new heroes <coughs> by our government. There is a price that the new the heroes pay. In the newspaper today was the story of a young Filipino maid under sentence of death in the United Arab Emirates for stabbing her employer as he tried to rape her. Here, the women are warned in their own language, Tagalog, of what to expect when they go abroad. Or hindi sila masyadong uh, conservative, di ba? Hindi ka guys sa Middle East na talagang conservative, uh, hindi ka guys sa Saudi Arabia. Talagang... Despite the dangers, these women cheerfully expose themselves to a life that is often not far short of slavery. But before they go, they must come here and listen to the problems that lie ahead in countries where they will be second class citizens. I asked some of them where they're going. Qatar. Have you been to the Middle East before? Never. Brunei. Oh, you're going to Brunei. Bahrain. Bahrain. For how long? For two years. Going to Taiwan. What sort of work will you be doing in Dubai? How will uh, your DH. Housekeeper. A DH, a domestic cooperative, because that's an easy way to to go there. Caretaker. Caretaker. Yes, sir. I just want to earn money and I, I just want to support my family and my uh, parents also. I want to work in Taiwan, sir, because I want to support my family, my father, mother, my brother and sister. When you're away, who, who will look after your family? My husband. I'm a college graduate and a major of English. Colorful as the traffic jams may be, I'm itching to get out of Manila. I do so in style, heading for the hills on a quiet Sunday morning, high above where the traffic jams would have been any other day of the week. Luzon is the largest of the 7,000 islands of the Philippines. Its northern end is composed of rugged mountains, where we hope to find the eighth wonder of the world, the rice terraces of Banawe. But the highland weather is turning bad, and Luis, my pilot, is not a happy man. The cloud base is too low for him to attempt a landing near the rice terraces, so he puts down on a village football pitch during a game. Leaving the teams to take half-time early, Luis organises alternative transport. Just, uh, just hailing a passing uh, jeepney. There's no way we're going to get up in the helicopter. There's another 1,000 feet above the clouds before we get to Manali. So we landed on in the middle of the school um, football pitch. I think, I think there's a game on while we came down. But the jeepney stopped. So should we go and ask him? I think he's, he's on. Good. Transfer to more primitive technology. We've got the Union Jack. 
jack off the back. Oh. <laughs> Too good to be true. Five minutes of landing, we're, we're on our way up there. How long is it to, to the terraces? How long a drive? Around one hour, sir. One hour drive. One hour drive. Right. Yeah. See much more this way. Well, more slowly, isn't it? Oh, we go. Our new driver, Rodolfo, has other ideas. He's clearly had Grand Prix training. We start to climb through 2,000 feet, through 3,000 feet. If it's rice terraces we want to see, Rodolfo will get us there. And he does. The trouble is that the terraces themselves are at 4,000 feet. This makes Hello. all the difference. Hello. <laughs> Come to see the rice terraces. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> behind, we, we made it. This is the viewpoint, and, and behind you are the uh, world famous Banaui rice terraces. You'll just yeah. you'll have to take my word for it. They are, they are there. Um, but unfortunately, as, as, you, as you know, the, there were problems with visibility. So, well, you can just close your eyes or imagine some rice terraces, and I'll read from the guidebook. <clears throat> The Banawi rice terraces, rightly called one of the eighth wonders of the world, stand at an altitude of 1,200 metres. It took the Ifugayo tribes people, with their primitive implements, over 2,000 years to create this imposing landscape. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear, it's taken us so long to get here. Helicopters don't come cheap. We've come all the way from Manila to see the rice terraces, and. and it's hard to see. <laughs> Should we do some other terraces? <laughs> it's all rather embarrassing. I make my excuses and retreat with Rodolfo to the highland city of Baguio, where strange things happen, but in much better visibility. <laughs> We're heading for number 114, Lord's Grotto Road, to witness surgery performed with bare hands without anaesthetic and without instruments. It's called psychic surgery. It has its roots among the forest peoples of the north. The surgeon who operates from number 114 is called the Reverend Jose Segundo. His hands, he claims, are guided by God. He and his assistant are operating on a young man called Gustav who has an arthritic limb. I'm surprised to hear a distinct pop, then blood appears. Psychic surgeons claim the blood appears through the skin by a form of magnetism. Now the other leg, and that noise again. This is surgery stripped of all the familiar trappings. No lights, no masks, no rubber gloves, no machines that go ping, just fingers that go pop. To me, it looked as though you were, uh, there was some sleight of hand that you were perhaps popping a, a little blood capsule or something like that, because I could see no way in which blood could come out of Gustav's leg without piercing the skin. There was, there was no mark on the skin at all, yet there was blood. Were you actually popping a little you to can, make him feel better? Yeah, you know, you cannot see what I am doing, the operation, unless that you have the third eye. If you have the third eye, this is one, two, and then the third eye here. Yes. If your eye, the third eye is open for you, then you can see what is that. Well, I could see with my two eyes. But that your there was two no... eyes, you can never see. To get a second opinion on my eyesight, I make my way to another address in Lord's Grotto Road the consulting rooms of Mr. Ambrosio Pellingen. 
As I arrive, his patient is summoned in for what is known as the bloody operation. The patient's wife waits outside. Ambrosio has no assistant. He asks me to help him. It looks as though you're opening the skin. You're making a hole with your fingers in his chest, and that's just not uh, possible, is it? What are you doing now? Are you being guided to something that you think yeah. is... Huh? In his hand is a small piece of slime, which he calls black toxin. Throughout, the patient remains fully conscious. Yes. I've had no training, you see, so I'm not quite sure what to do. Have you trained medically? No, sir. It was, I think, uh, I have... Uh, I take it uh, from, my, uh, from my ancestors. Really? Yeah. There's a little channel in there. I mean, it doesn't look as though there's a hole, but there is no hole because there's no mark on the body, so I don't know quite where this red stuff, which is also on me, where this blood comes from. There. That's, uh, that's someone could analyse that. My fingers are completely unsterilised. They're unclean, yeah, yeah. and they're going his wound. Mind. Never mind. Why will that not uh, it, um, infect the wound and make him worse? I will soon uh, explain to this. He is, uh, there will be no contamination or anything uh, as long as healers are, are the one who is working on it. As long as the healer is the one who's working on it? Yes. There is so no. you create a sort of spiritual antiseptic around you? Yes, it. yes. That is the use of garlic. Use garlic? Ah, yeah. oh, now we're beginning to get some secrets of the trade. It's easy to be sceptical about psychic surgery, but if you believe it works, it clearly works. After all, Ambrosio and the Reverend are busy seven days a week. Philippine history, they say, began with the Spanish and ended with the Americans. 300 years in the convent, 50 years in Hollywood. These mountains, with their thousand-year-old terraces and ancient forms of healing, leave me with the impression of something more powerful. Seven hundred miles south, it's all so different. It's hot and it's tropical and it's December. Next day, the director decides it's time I learnt scuba diving. My instructor is called Louis. Okay, so we'll put the mask on, yeah. make sure there's no hair in it. Repeat the exercises. Okay, yeah. that's good. Louis tells me the worst that can happen. It's a dangerous world down there, a world of embolism, ear squeeze and nitrogen narcosis. But by next day, I'm ready for the reef. Once you realise that your role model is a fish and not a human, a whole new world opens up. I'm enjoying it so much, I decide to stay down here and join some fellow divers for lunch. You can't understand what anyone's saying, but it's all pretty obvious.
back on the surface, I've reached the last stage of my Philippine journey. I'm aboard the ferry Princess of the Pacific, heading for the port of Zamboanga. I'm not sure if I'm hearing things. I decide to take a closer look below decks. What I hadn't realized is that Zamboanga is one of the cockfighting centers of the Philippines. And here they all are, arranged, packaged, labeled, and probably pretty fed up. This is Zamboanga, our home until we can find a boat out of here to Borneo. The dockside is not for the faint-hearted. As we fight our way off the boat, I can't help wondering where all those cockerels are going to end up. The answer is places like this, the Galleria, Zamboanga's largest cockpit. The Spanish conquerors introduced the sport 400 years ago. There's a cockfest here about every other day. The fights themselves may not last more than a few seconds. It doesn't seem to matter. It's all about betting. This provokes strong passions. How much uh, our money is bet in each bet? Uh, is there a minimum? Minimum of the, for people on the ring side, 500. For people outside... On the rings are 500 pesos, that's about $20. Yeah. So yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. And how is the bet recorded? Uh, no one seems to write anything down. Yeah, the, the colors, the crystals, we call them locally the crystals. The crystals, the men in pink, yeah. Yes, the, they can remember faces, who bet it and who bet against, you know. So there's nothing much that has been recorded. It's an ugly sport to watch, but there's huge local enthusiasm. One man told me this is the Philippines' number one pastime. But, he added sadly, basketball is catching up. And how, how many fights a cock say it survives one fight? How many sort of fights would a good cock survive? Uh, more than 15. 15. More than 15 fights, mm. and then they are, given, uh, they are given back to the owners for breeding purposes. As others wait to fight, the in-house vet is backstage to patch up those who already have. <laughs> but this is the Philippines, and alongside the gore is the glamour. The beauty competition is widely held and widely revered. Imelda Marcos was a Miss Manila. Winning a beauty competition can be an important step in a girl's career. Judging one could be an important step in my career. Tonight, beside the sea at Zamboanga, my fellow judges and I will choose Miss Bella Pacifica. It's not just vital statistics that will win prizes here. I didn't hear a vital statistic all evening. A winner must be beautiful, but she must also show intelligence and a strong moral sense. This is a very Catholic country. If your husband told you he was going away for a year to film a documentary series in many faraway countries, 
Would you try to stop him? If so, why? Although I haven't been married, yes, I will not stop him because I believe that true love is tested by time. And as long as you love and trust each other, no one and nothing can stand in your way. Thank you. Thank you very much, well, Christina. Thank you. Well, I believe that trust is the key to a successful relationship. So I will allow my husband to go to other countries. And besides, it's his job. He's not going there to go girl hunting. So I'm Absolutely sure, right. Michael, you get the clue. <laughs> Tonight, of course, is an exception. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies. I really can feel the tension mounting. There are many things of beauty in the Philippines, but I think if I had to choose one object that represents the spirit of this country, it would have to be the jeepney. It, it's, it's pure Filipino, completely exuberant and, and wild, and not totally in touch with reality or practicality. I love one. <laughs> I've been longing to drive my own jeepney since I first set eyes on one in Manila, 10 days ago. But they were all stuck in traffic jams up there. Down here in Zambo, you could be on a racetrack. That's not a bad idea. I could inaugurate the first Zambuanga Grand Prix, for jeepneys only. On second thoughts, I might just take it to Borneo. Follow Michael as the updated Phileas Fogg around the world in 80 days, streaming now on iPlayer. Coming up, a twisted thriller for Saturday nights from the creator of The Killing. BBC4 brings you DNA in 10 minutes.